And now your host for Rabbi's Rant, Rabbi Eric Walker. Shalom, y'all. I'm happy to share today's rant with you. If it wasn't the Holy Spirit that caused my ears to tune in to the words I heard that evening, then I have no explanation as to why those three words pierced my heart. It wasn't expected, and I had never once before given that much thought to it. But on that particular night, God opened my ears and something changed. It was the night of the September 26, 2016 presidential debate. That, mu- that night might not stand out in your mind in a particularly memorable way, but for me, for me it was an epiphany, a revelation of something I had never once considered. By now you're asking yourself, what three words could have possibly flipped the, his switch that he would make so much of them. Let, first, let me let's set the stage for you. This debate had more about race relations than any of the other debates. There were references to Ferguson and Baltimore, a police shooting in Tulsa and Charlotte. Black Lives Matter was spoken about, and moderator Lester Holt made the statement that a fair share of Americans say that racial tensions in this country have been amplified to the highest it's been in decades. When asked what each candidate planned to do about the growing divide between the racial communities, the Democratic candidate immediately began to speak about gun violence and the need for more controls to tackle the plague of gun violence. I was not stirred by those words. Donald Trump responded with a law and order agenda to take the guns from the violent criminals while protecting our Second Amendment rights. Again, I was not stirred. It was in the rebuttal those three little words were spoken. Here is the quote that contained those three little words. Hillary Clinton said during the debate, it's really unfortunate that Trump paints such a dire negative picture of black communities in our country, saying that the vibrancy of the black church, the black businesses that employ so many people and the opportunities that so many families are working to provide to their kids are something to be proud of. I have to tell you, my heart was pierced. Three words, something in my upbringing in a Jewish community I had never heard, something I had never been exposed to or even considered existed as an entity. I grew up in a Jewish community in Pittsburgh. Our schools were not segregated and busing occurred in some neighborhoods, but not in mine. Our homes and families welcomed any of our friends. And I only knew of high school rivalries, but never attributed them to race. We had our own issues living in a Catholic city that was divided along ethnic European lines. The Jews lived in one part of town. The Polish and Italians had their own neighborhoods. But we were mostly immigrant families or came from immigrant grandparents. It seemed only natural to seek out those who shared a similar lifestyle and heritage. We lived near the synagogues, walked to school, and walked home for lunch with friends who lived on my street, and as Jews, we were excluded from certain clubs and organizations and had our own post-Holocaust issues to deal with. At Penn State, we were a total blended student body, and together, black and white forged friendships and 
protested together, side by side. In the corporate world with Wrangler Jeans, AT&T, and HP, I worked alongside of people from every race, every religion, and every national origin. My first real encounter with racism was when I moved to Atlanta in 1975 and learned of a country club that banned blacks and Jews. Maybe I had reached an age of awareness, but found plenty of public golf courses to play and was not prohibited from being a guest of one of my clients. But the world around me was changing. But since I was not raised in a home where racism was present, it was not an issue that caused me any difficulty. It wasn't anything that I ever thought about. When I came to faith 20 years ago and joined the family of faith and the belief in Jesus as the promised Jewish Messiah, I thought I was being joined together with a body unified around a common belief in God's perfect plan of salvation. Now, in a presidential debate, I hear those three words, the black church. Is it not enough that there are some 38,000 denominations of Christianity that we now have a racially divided body? I was truly undone by this. When I read the scriptures, we are all created in the image of God. It clearly says God is no respecter of persons, therefore we are all created the same. I read a quote the other day that made sense to me. Sins like racism are passed on from generation to generation. Jesus may live in your heart, but Grandpa lives in your bones. Each of us, African American, Latino, white, Russian, Jew, Arab, Serbian, African, Chinese, Korean, and Pole, must take the journey of Abraham. We must decisively leave our family, our culture, and our country and learn to do life in the new family of Jesus. It's not assimilation, it is unity. As believers, we are called to be set apart, but not set apart from each other, set apart from the world. The three words, the black church, grew out of oppression, and there's no different than the Jewish ghettos my people were forced to live in. We were drawn to each other because we shared in a similar plight, hatred based on ethnicity. There is a biblical reason that Jews are persecuted and have been since God spoke the oldest prophecy in the Bible. In Genesis 3.15 we read, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. In this prophecy, God reveals that the Messiah will come and that the offspring of Satan, the Antichrist, will rise up. But the seed of the woman, Jesus, will crush his head. It's really quite simple when you think about it. If you kill the Jews, then Jesus is never born. That was Pharaoh's goal, but God intervened and spared us. Haman came along and tried to annihilate us and failed. Upon the birth of Jesus, Herod, a descendant of Esau, attempted to kill the baby Jesus and failed. But it did not stop there. Jesus said in Matthew 23, 37 through 39, that he would not return until Jerusalem, the Jews called for him to come. This gave Satan another opportunity and used the likes of Adolf Hitler to try and defeat God's plan for God's people. Kill the Jews and Jesus does not return and Satan rules the earth. 
This gives us a biblical explanation for the rise in anti-Semitism and so many of the theologies that rob Israel of its inheritance. But where? Where is the biblical justification for a racial divide because of the color of one's skin? Did Jesus not say a house divided against itself will not stand? No baby has ever been born a racist. It's a learned behavior passed from one generation to the next. For those who do not know the Lord, it's out of pure ignorance and lack of knowledge. But what about the believers? What about us? Those who read the Bible, do the scriptures not say in John, 1 John 2.11, but anyone who hates a brother or sister is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. They do not know where they are going because the darkness has blinded them. And in 1 John 3:15 and 16, anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer and you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. And in John 7:24. Do not judge according to appearance, but judge the righteous judgment. And in James 2 and 1, my brothers and sisters, do not show prejudice if you possess faith in our glorious Lord, Jesus Christ. I could go on and on and quote more passages that clearly state that racism is a sin, but I believe I've made my point very clear. As believers, we are called to be in the world, not of the world. How far have we strayed from the very words, love your neighbor as yourself? It's been since 1963 at the Washington DC Civil Rights March that Martin Luther King Jr. shared these famous words. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Here we are 54 years later, and Martin Luther King's dream has still not been fulfilled. God says, Behold, how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell together in unity. Those three words, the black church, struck a nerve, and I have not been able to let it go. I reached out to my friends in the community and asked them if this was an issue. They were surprised that I was unaware of the depth and the deep history of this issue. So on today's show, we're going to meet with three leaders in the African-American community here in Birmingham. And I'm going to investigate the roots and heritage of those three words, the black church. I want to know if it was born out of racism but exists today because of choice. Or is there an underlying root of racism even within the body of Christ? Regardless of the history and the reason, one thing is clear. Division is the strategy of the enemy, Satan. It is not a strategy of God. God does not see color, and neither do I. And I, as a white Jewish believer, am, unwill am willing to explore this issue. If there is racism in the church on either side of the aisle, it needs to be brought out into the light. It only takes one spark to start a fire. And that spark for me were those three words, the black church. And that, my friends, is the rabbi's rant for today. <laughs>